and thank you for joining us for conversations with trust experts with a special focus on private placement life insurance. My name is Brandon Santula, and I'm the Chief Fiduciary Officer of Peak Trust Company with offices in Alaska, Delaware, and Nevada. I'm delighted to be joined by Matt Jones today, who is the President of Legacy Capital in Little Rock, Arkansas. In addition to Matt's duties as president, he is a wealth advisor to affluent and ultra-affluent clients throughout the United States. As a non-practicing attorney, Matt has a passion and keen understanding of finance and investments. With his diverse background, he has a unique understanding of the relationship between financial, legal, and emotional issues, as well as family dynamics faced by ultra-affluent clients. I have worked with Matt for the better part of 25 years with his sophisticated and professional team, and that has resulted in many satisfied clients. I'm also delighted to be joined by my associate, Jamie Rowley, who is a senior trust officer and director and resident expert of private placement life insurance platform. Jamie holds the prestigious certified trust and financial advisor designation. And Jamie works with some of the nation's most sophisticated attorneys, advisors, and family offices. In addition to her fiduciary and other company related responsibilities, she's been a leader in the creation and ongoing best in class management of hundreds of private placement life insurance and private placement variable annuity policies. There will be a question and answer uh, opportunity at the end of this presentation. Please take the time to type your questions into the box uh, and we will answer as many questions as possible as time, as time allows. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Matt. Yeah, so uh, real quickly, just a, a summary of the, the agenda and the categories that we're going to be covering. I'm going to talk a little bit about what private placement life insurance or PPLI is, uh, who, who, what types of clients or families should consider it, what are the differences between uh, PPLI and traditional insurance, and then we'll talk also a little bit about preferred jurisdictions and some of the uh, statutory and other requirements uh, to be able to have these policies domiciled in some of the jurisdictions that we'll talk about later. And then and alluded to, we'll uh, close out with some Q&A that you guys are welcome to do through the Q&A link on the presentation. So if we'll just start with the first slide. So this is a, a question that I commonly get. And I think for all of us professionals, whether whether you're in the financial services industry like myself, you're, you're a CPA, you're a tax attorney, we all have a lot of acronyms that we use and are comfortable with, but sometimes our, our clients and other people are not. So the acronym that this is uh, most often referred to is PPLI, which stands for Private Placement Life Insurance. So I'm going to kind of break that up into two components. Uh, what does a private placement stand for? Basically, private placement means that these products are not generally available to the broad pub, broad investing public. Similar to a private placement for maybe private equity or for a hedge fund, there are, uh, first of all, investor minimum requirements. Most of the firms require you to be what's called a qualified purchaser, which means someone has to have at least five million of investable assets to qualify. Uh, and, and secondly, there are typically uh, more rigorous and in, in, complicated documents, subscription documents that are involved in this. So that's kind of the private placement component of it. Uh, obviously, life insurance is in the word. This is a life insurance policy. It really operates on a chassis that's very similar to uh, a retail variable universal life policy that you might acquire uh, at any of the major insurance companies. So it's, it's both private placement and it's life insurance. On the life insurance side, the reason that's important is a PPLI meets all of the statutory and regulatory guidelines of traditional life insurance, such as whole life or universal life. Uh, most of these requirements are codified in section 7702 of the tax code. Why is that important? The reason that's important, even though these products are very different than a traditional retail universal or whole life policy, it's actually some of the common benefits they have that make them so attractive. And so I want to uh, outline those here below. Again, every one of these are not only uh, benefits that you get in a traditional life insurance policy, but also private placement. The first being tax deferred growth of the cash value 
and investments. There are only a handful of vehicles out there. Annuities are one of them. Insurance is one of them. Retirement plans uh, are another common one where you get tax deferred growth. So you, you do get that benefit. Secondly, uh, at the death of the insured, uh, it, the, the proceeds of a private placement policy are paid out income tax free. So there are no taxes on that. Most of these policies are structured in a way where they're owned by an irrevocable trust, often a GST exempt trust. They can also be estate tax and GST exempt, but properly structured should always be income tax free. Uh, third, uh, in addition to those two, you have tax free access to the cash value and the growth on that cash value via loans and withdrawals, similar to what you would have in a traditional retail. One of the great benefits of life insurance is it gets FIFO taxation, meaning you're first dollars in, your premiums or your basis are the first dollars out. So if a, someone puts a million dollars a year for 10 years into this policy and several years from now it's worth $30 million, the first 10 million pulled out is actually just pulling their basis out. There are no tax consequences. They're referred to as withdrawals. Um, and then over and above that, you can access funds through loans. Next one, the, uh, the the next one is creditor protection. And this does vary from state to state. I happen to live in Arkansas. Our creditor protections are very nominal here. I think it's like five or $10,000 for a policyholder. There are some states out there, if you are domiciled or live there, where you get 100% creditor protection of all of the of, of your cash value in your, in your policy. So that's something I would defer to on a state-by-state -state basis. The, the other thing I'll, I'll point out, this will come into the conversation later, but because this is life insurance and typically we are talking about very large premiums and very large death benefits on these, uh, they do require full medical and financial underwriting, just like you would have to do on a traditional life insurance policy. So that's really kind of what private placement life insurance or PPLI is. Great, Matt. Thank you so much. Um, you have such a wealth of knowledge, so we really appreciate your time today. So our next question is, who does P private placement life insurance make sense for? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, I want to emphasize that this is a niche product. Uh, because of the premium limitations and a variety of other things, this is something that is really only suitable for a very small portion of the population. Um, if we could go back to, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so these numbers I'm gonna use are not absolutes, but they're general guidelines that I give people. We think that private placement is suitable for families that have a liquid, and I emphasize liquid, net worth of at least 25 million. That is at the minimum end. So obviously we have already excluded a su substantial portion of the population by putting that in place. Why is that so? Well, it really has to do with the premium minimums that most of the carriers have. And, and they're typically two to two and a half million dollars of premium just to be able to access one of these. Now, uh, most of the carriers allow you to get that in over three, four, or five years, but we're still talking about several hundred thousand dollars a year of premiums. Our general rule with our company is we don't like to see more than 10%. We can might do 15% of somebody's liquid net worth in these. So if you do the math uh, at a two, million, two to two and a half million dollar minimum and 10% of, of their liquid net worth, you kind of hit that 20 to 25 million liquid net worth range. So again, this is for the affluent and and Quite frankly, for most of the clients, we we use the ultra affluent. The next thing uh, that that we have you know seen in most of our clients that are doing it is they're they're they have a desire and the resources to do multi generational uh, wealth transfer planning. And what we mean by that is we are typically looking at using dollars from generation one, occasionally generation two, funded for the benefit of generation two and three and beyond. And so while there is no requirement that these be owned in GST exempt trusts, most of the structures that we have put in place and most of the clients we are working with are putting these in GST exempt trusts where there is, there is an expectation that these will likely be left alone for 20, 30, or 40 years. We'll talk a little bit later about why that becomes so powerful with some of the tax advantages that this product affords its owners. So again, clients wanting to do multi-generational uh, wealth transfer planning. Um, the, the, the next one is clients that, that either already have or desire to incorporate 
complex or alternative investments in their portfolios. What we tend to find is when you start getting up with people with liquid net worths of 25, 50, 100 million dollars or more, of course, most of them own uh, equities and various forms of fixed income, but they also uh, have, have investments in hedge funds, in private equity, in private lending, managed futures, real estate, a lot of these more complex assets, which are wonderful diversifiers in a client's portfolio, but they come with a couple of negatives. One of the negatives is a lot of them are not super tax efficient. So uh, they may pass their returns on to the owner in the form of short-term gains or a lot of ordinary income on an annual basis. The second is many of them have complex tax reporting, which comes in the form of a K-1, many of which are not uh, completed or done by April 15th. And so uh, there's a, an income tax inefficiency that happens in a lot of these investments. Additionally, there is complex tax reporting. We'll talk you know, later about what it is about PPLI that makes those advantageous to own in there. But certainly for clients, the, the I would say over 50%, and in some cases closer to 100% of the investments that we have in private placement life insurance are in alternative investments as opposed to you know, traditional U.S. large cap, mid cap, small cap equities or traditional fixed income. Um, I already alluded to, but, but clients looking for creditor protection, even though many of these are going to be owned in, or most of them in, in GST exempt trusts, if you are in a state that has uh, very generous creditor protection for life insurance cash values and you're a neurosurgeon or you operate a company uh, that exposes you to significant uh, liability, uh, this could be, in addition to your retirement plan, since there are no funding limits on these, this can be a great way to build up a pool of creditor-protected assets. Again, this varies dramatically from state to state, so I would certainly defer clients to uh, counsel in their state of domicile or residence, but there are some ones out there that have great creditor protection. Great explanation, Matt. Thank you so much. Can you kind of compare and contrast or tell us how private placement life insurance is different from retail and insurance products? Yes. And, and again, uh, real quickly, I'm going to hit how they're similar because I think that's very, very important. And then and then we'll we'll go into what they're different. But how they're similar, again, they meet, it meets all the statutory uh, guidelines of Section 7702, which gives you tax-free growth uh, of your cash value and your investments tax-free death benefit upon death, tax-free access to the cash value and growth via loans uh, and withdrawals. And, and we've already referenced creditor protection. Again, just to reiterate, that's how they're the same. That's not really the question, but I think that's very important. How are they different? The first significant way they are different is how these are funded compared to a traditional insurance policy. Uh, in, in our practice, we work with a lot of wealthy families that are buying uh, substantial amounts of insurance for estate tax liquidity. And, and so in a traditional policy, what do you typically want? Someone wants to pay the minimum amount of premium they possibly can in order to get the maximum amount of death benefit. And a lot of times I say that and people kind of look at me <laughs> like I got a, a, a horn growing out of my head. Well, duh, Matt, of course, that's what you want to do. Well, that's true when, you're, when your focus is to maximize the death benefit that you're needing uh, uh, for, to cover estate taxes, business by sale planning, whatever. When we look at a private placement funding structure, we typically do exactly the opposite. So now we are going maximum premium and minimum death benefit. And people will often ask, well, why would I want to put in a whole lot more money and get a lot less death benefit? Well, the answer is because while these are life insurance products and the death benefit is an important component of them, uh, one of the big benefits of these is the tax deferred growth that you're getting. And so in, in, in any insurance contract, the, more, the most expensive thing in the product are your COIs or your cost of insurance. So the higher the death benefit is, the higher your COIs are, which actually decrease the growth rate of your cash value. And so we designed these policies since most of them were really trying to uh, get investment growth in them in addition to the death benefit. We want to have a minimum death benefit and maximum funding option. So that, that's number one, the structure is very different. Number two, uh, and this is very, very important is the investment options. When you are in a retail variable universal life insurance contract, which 
we've we've issued uh, dozens of over the years. It's a very common product out in the market. Most of the major life insurance carriers offer them. Your investments are limited to what we're going to call IDFs, which stand for insurance dedicated funds. And most of them are just mutual fund clones. So you'll have uh, uh, maybe the Vanguard uh, S&P 500 index or the Fidelity Contra Fund or it, most of the major mutual fund companies from, from a T. Rowe Price to a Vanguard to a Fidelity will have options on these, but they're just basically clones of their retail mutual funds. When you go into the private placement life insurance world, they will have those same I IDFs, which are effectively mutual fund clones, but in addition to that, they have a very uh, diverse menu of alternative investments. Uh, and, and these include multiple uh, hedge fund strategies. They include uh, multiple private equity strategies. They include private lending and private credit. They include managed future strategies. They include um, uh, uh, master limited partnerships or MLPs. They include uh, real estate lending and real estate investments. And so um, I had, had talked earlier about when you get into these alternative investments, they have two negatives a lot of times. They're tax inefficient, number one, and number two, uh, they they uh, produce K-1 uh, tax reporting, uh, which which complicates clients' tax returns, and many of them are, the K-1s are often not issued until uh, sometimes in late summer uh, or, or even into the early fall. So the benefits you get in a, in a private placement chassis is you eliminate income taxes since you're in this tax-deferred environment, uh, of, of, of that you get with any insurance policy. And then secondly, because they're owned inside of that, there are there is no tax reporting. So uh, even though you might own a hedge fund or a private equity fund or a private lending fund individually that produces a K-1, because these are owned inside a PPLI structure, there is no tax reporting. So you've eliminated income taxes and tax reporting. That is a huge benefit to uh, these ultra wealthy families, particularly when they're owned in GST exempt trusts, which are, uh, you know, re reach the maximum uh, tax bracket at very low income thresholds. So again, they're funded differently and, and they have, you know, more complex and sophisticated investment options. The next one is a really, really big one and it's cost. Um, first of all, the cost structure on private placement is very transparent. For any of you on the call who have ever looked at a life insurance illustration, uh, you know, one of the most common things you see that always makes you scratch your head a little bit is you see somebody put in, you know, $100,000 a year uh, for, for 10 years. And after three years, you know, they might have, you know, $50,000, $80,000 of, of cash surrender value, and they put in $300,000. You're like, where did all the money go? Uh, well, a, a lot of the traditional life insurance contracts are front loaded. So they cover commissions, fees, and a lot of other costs up front. And it's always, it, it's almost impossible to actually see where those monies are going. In a private placement structure, the costs are very transparent. You can see where every dollar of expense is going from your mortality and expense charges to your, your state uh, premium taxes to you know, any commission loads that might be in there. So, so it's very transparent, number one. Number two, they're very, very low cost and institutionally priced. Um, so you might see uh, 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 loads in the one to two to three percent range on these where uh, you know, they can be 70 to 100 percent year one in a traditional life insurance contract. Um, so so they have little uh, to no commissions or or, or fees. Um, the other big difference is uh, the distribution of private placement life insurance. Uh, if you talk to most insurance advisors, whether they're independent, whether they work at a at a captive insurance company and you ask them about PPLI or about private placement, Many of them are unfamiliar with it, or if they are familiar with it, they've they've never implemented or put one into place. Uh, and and the reason for that is, is these products are distributed through a a very uh, small number of advisors and firms around the country. The reason for that has to do that 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 you not only need to be able to do complex medical and financial underwriting, which there are you know high end boutique firms around the country that do that, but you also need to have an understanding of the complex investment structures that go inside of these. And so, um, so that's one of them. And then the final one is there are only a, a, about five or six carriers in the United States that issue private placement life insurance. I shouldn't say only four or five that issue them, but I would say that the substantial majority of the premiums uh, of the cash value and of the death benefit is with five to six 
uh, insurance companies that uh, really specialize in this area. Some of them are some pretty large household names that you might rec recognize. Some of them are uh, more niche boutique firms that really specialize in this. But those are the, the primary differences, Brandon. I guess the last one is just who the clients are, which is, which is you know, the, the affluent and in most cases, the ultra affluent. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, again, just so much good information. Uh, next question, can you just explain how private placement life insurance works and give us an idea you know, how the individuals on our call today might be able to reach out to you and just get a better understanding, again, how it works? Yeah, yeah I think, great question. And and I, I really turn this into an investment conversation, even though this really is, you know, I, I cannot reemphasize enough, this is a life insurance product and a life insurance structure. It does have a death benefit. It requires medical underwriting, and it, it, it is uh, legally and statutorily, uh, it is a life insurance product. But when we start talking with these families, what they realize real quickly is the cost structure of these products and what they ultimately do for them becomes more of an investment focus. And I'm going to use an example uh, um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about a, a, a about a client that we worked with, but when when you look at these, if you if you have a client and says, okay, Matt, I think that with this investment mix, we can earn a 10% rate of return uh, if I own these 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 funds inside of private placement or outside. So tell me what that looks like inside versus outside. Well, I say, okay, if you're going to own uh, hedge funds and private equity and private lending, let's just say that you're that your average tax rate is going to be in the 30 to 40% range if you own these in your trust and you just own them individually in the trust, not inside of PPLI. Well, you, well, if you're earning 10% uh, uh, at a gross rate of return after taxes, if you have 30 to 40%, you're netting 6 to 7%, okay? If you own those exact same investments inside of a private placement structure, your cost over a 20 20 year period is going to run anywhere from at the low side, probably 60 to 65 basis points, high side, maybe 100 basis points. So let's just call it 80 basis points. So now you're owning an investment that is generating a return of 10% and, and you're netting 9.2% instead of six or 7%. So you're basically exchanging 80 basis points of, of cost, which are your COIs and your mortality and expense charges inside this policy in exchange for a 30 to 40% tax rate. Well, when you run that out with most of the clients we're working where we're planning on leaving these in place for 30, 40 plus years, and you compound out 9.2% versus six to 7% owning the exact same funds and investments, the difference in value for you know, generations two, three, or four down the road is substantial. And so that's really the, the where a lot of the power lies, Jamie, in using these products. You've got some information up here on, on jurisdictions, and I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit more about some of the details of those, but there are really only a handful of jurisdictions when we're working with families that we acquire these, these policies in. And there's, let me, let me tell you the reason for that. The reason for that is there, there's very attractive premium loads in these states. If somebody's putting in $10,000, $20,000, $30,000, uh, the premium taxes aren't a big deal. When somebody's putting in a million dollars, $2 million, $5 million a year, and you can save 2% a year on premium taxes, you're talking about $20,000 per million. So so the, the, the way the jurisdictions um, have their premium taxes structure becomes very important. So the bulk of ours have been done in the state, state of Alaska, which was one of the first states to um, pass, you know, very aggressive uh, state planning legis legislation and codified that, but also very attractive premium tax. The other one is, uh, is Delaware. We do a lot of work in Delaware. I know that you guys operate in both of those states as well. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, tremendous amount of, of useful and practical information that you've you've provided us today so far. Can you give us, a, a provide us with a real life example of a family that has acquired private placement life insurance? Yeah, so um, we, we worked with a family uh, for over two decades and when we first got engaged with them, it was the late nineties. And the family had a, a, a very uh, quickly growing regional business that operated in several states. The business was all, already worth well into the nine figures at that point in time. And we got involved really working uh, with their local council doing some estate planning. And at that point in time, we did a 
uh, we did a, a sale, a gift and sale of about 20% of the stock of the company uh, to a GST exempt trust set up in the state of Alaska and also administered uh, at the time Alaska Trust, now Peak Trust. So this is a actually not, not only a, a over two decade client of ours, but also a Peak Trust. And so at the time, uh, we we put that in place. There was no private placement done. We basically just did a, a, a sale to an intentionally defective grantor trust of about 20% of the company's stock, which was was worth at the time probably, I don't know, $20, $25 million. Uh, and at that time, we also put in a substantial amount of traditional life insurance, not private placement, uh, because this family, like, like many of our clients, had a substantial estate tax liability uh, still outstanding. Um, uh, in two, fast forward to 2013, really not a whole lot else happened with the family's planning over that period of time. In 2013, they sold their company uh, to a public company company for several hundred million dollars. So at that point in time, now we had had basically company stock and a little bit of liquidity in this trust in Alaska. Now, all of a sudden, we had close to a hundred million dollars that poured into this trust. And, and the family was looking at not only what do we do with this capital from the sale of our business, uh, they've been you know, pr primarily in a, in a retail business and also a substantial amount of real estate. Now they had all this liquidity. And you know, we concluded through their planning that they had probably at least 15 to $20 million. G G1 was still alive at that time. Uh, G2 was was in their late 30s to early 40s. And, and their G, they were G3 had been, several had been born, but they were all fairly young. And so after looking at a lot of different options, they decided that they wanted to uh, take some amount of what was in this GST exempt trust and put it into to private placement. So uh, we've been putting a million and a half dollars a year for this particular family into a private placement contract. Um, and, and so when they were looking at it, they were pretty comfortable that G1 at this time was probably late 60s to early 70s. G2, again, kind of late 30s into their early 40s they were pretty comfortable that neither one of them were going to need access to this. So they were really looking at putting capital to work for 40 plus years for G3 and members of G4 that, that, that aren't even born yet. Um, and, and again, so we decided to do that uh, using PPLI. They asked us to model this. So, so I'll kind of give you some numbers on this particular one. They asked us to model this, even though their, their hope was to produce, you know, something more in the eight, nine, 10% range. They said, we would like to model this fairly conservatively. Uh, and so we ran this at a 7% gross earnings rate, uh, putting in $1,500,000 a year for 10 years. So funding for, for 10 years with $15 million in aggregate and then stopping. Uh, the insured was 30, uh, 30, the insureds were 39 years old at this point in time. And so we fast forward it again at a 7% gross earnings rate. I think their net over their life ended up being about 6.2. Um, that, that at age 85, which was their projected life expectancy based on mortality tables, this policy is projected to have $187 million in it. If they were to die at that point in time, that would pay out in the form of a death benefit, which is income tax free. So they're 15 million grew to 187 million, again, at a 7% gross earnings rate, 6.2 net. Uh, not only is it income tax-free, but because it was structured in a GST exempt trust, it will not be included in uh, generation um, one's estate or generation two's estate. So just really some powerful planning that we were able to do uh, with the structure of, of this private placement life insurance contract for this family. Happy to, if there's any questions anybody has, has chimed in on, on, on this or other, but that's a, that's a, a case that uh, is, is a really long-term client of both ours and of Peak Trust that, you know, I would call a very good success story for private placement life insurance. Thanks again, Matt, for that detailed explanation as to um, <clears throat> a, a real life example. I'd like to pivot for just a moment if we could. Jamie, you've, you've been a party to, to literally hundreds of, of, of these policies. Uh, both here and in Delaware. Can you tell us what is required to take advantage of the, the relevant state premium tax? Of course, I'd be happy to. So um, just to uh, really explain, uh, just high level, um, for Alaska and, and Delaware, there are slight differences, but um, in Alaska, if you can have a trust or an LLC, whereas Delaware, you can only obtain private placement life insurance through a trust. Uh, so I'm going to consider a trust and an LLC as the owner of this private placement life insurance. So as I say owner, just know it's a trust or an LLC. So 
you do have to have um, an owner physically located in the state that you're applying for. That can be, again, Alaska or Delaware, but it can also be, you know, South Dakota or other jurisdictions. Um, that owner uh, will be expected to execute that application physically in the state. Um, and then all premiums do have to be paid from the state, Alaska or Delaware, or any other state that you're applying in. Um, and then the final, you know, that policy does have to be delivered to the Alaska or Delaware or the applicable state um, that you're looking to obtain private placement life insurance through. Jamie, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think you touched on it a bit, but are there any distinctions between Alaska and Delaware? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there are you know, several distinctions. So not only the premium tax is different. Um, so in Alaska, it's 2.7% on the first 100,000 and then 0.08% on anything in excess of 100,000. And then moving to Delaware, Delaware has 2% tax on the first 100,000, and then 0% tax on anything in excess of 100,000. And then, um, you know, thinking about kind of flexibility, um, maybe your clients have different, different preferences. Um, so in Alaska, again, I did touch on, uh, Alaska, you can obtain private placement life insurance through a trust or an LLC. However, you know, based on statutes in Delaware, um, you can only obtain private life, private placement life insurance through a trust. So there, there are some slight differences, some differences in the premium tax, but also in who can own the private placement. Um, so, you know, both are great jurisdictions to work within. Um, and of course, you can work with Peak, uh, myself, and Brandon. And so um, it's really just based on the estate planning goals that the client is, is looking for and which jurisdiction makes the most sense. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for that careful and, and thorough explanation. I think the audience will find that very helpful. Hey, Brandon, if I could chime in one thing too, you know, the there, there basically has to be, as Jamie just outlined, kind of a, a nexus of, of activity within the state of domicile to be able to afford yourself to number one, the, the trust code of that state, but also to be able to qualify for um, uh, the premium taxes in issuing in those states. The other thing that's really important is as you're making changes, investment changes and other modifications to these policies, those are generally done uh, in conjunction with the, the trust officers in those states. So I know very regularly, you know, we have clients that are uh, changing their allocation. They're putting new premiums into it and we're allocating those premiums. And so to the extent there are forms or things that need to be signed uh, need to be signed by the insurance company, the client uh, uh, trustee of the trust or administrator or manager of the LLC will sign those. But in addition to that, uh, in most instances, uh, there's going to need to be a signature from somebody in y'all's case at Peak Trust. So regularly, I'm dealing with Brandon and Jamie and their team. If we're making an allocation change, we're getting uh, the client to sign a form, but that also gets filtered through uh, peak trust and get signed and then get sent off to the insurance company. So there's an kind of an ongoing and active relationship with the trust company, not just to get the policy issued and put in place, but as far as ongoing management, y'all did allude to the fact that the premiums are actually paid through there. So every year when we're making premium payments, those premiums are wired into an account at peak trust and then peak trust actually sends the premium to the insurance company. Yeah, so thank you, Matt. That uh, great content there. So I want to just add on to that. So as you you know mentioned, there's going to be different allocations, you know, different things that the owner, being the trust or the LLC, will have to sign on behalf of that policy. Um, and like you just mentioned, you know, Peak would be either appointed as trustee of the trust or manager of the LLC, and then Peak would be responsible, or an individual here at Peak would be responsible for signing coordinating those premiums, um, you know, reaching out to the client, the agent, the advisor, whoever it is that we are working with to ensure that those premiums are paid through the account here at Peak. So, so good, you know, good information there. I appreciate you touching on that. Um, just kind of pivoting again, uh, moving to our next question. So I, I understand the value and I, I hope that, you know, everyone is 
receiving as much information and value from this webinar as I hope. Um, you know, private placement sounds great. Uh, can you tell us why we haven't heard more about this? Yes, it's a question I get a lot. We do a lot of, we work real closely with a lot of tax lawyers and accountants. And if there are ones that have, have never heard of this before, one of the first questions I ask is, why have I not heard about this? And I think it goes back a little bit to what I talked about earlier of this being a number one, a niche product. So this is just because of the premium minimums and the investor thresholds. These are really only applicable to a very small portion of our population, probably less than one tenth of 1% of, of the population. It happened to be our clientele and y'all's clientele, and I'm sure the clientele of a lot of people on the phone. Uh, so, so that's one of them. Uh, the second thing is, you know, they're only uh, issued by a, a very small number of companies, as I alluded to earlier, five to six companies that have the bulk of the premium and the death benefit in this space. So there's really not a, a wide marketing effort. And then I think third, and this is quite frankly, probably the most important, is there are just not many advisors in the country that have uh, expertise and specialize in these areas. Uh, you will find you know, some in, in, your, in your metropolitan areas but because of the small market for these, number one, because of the complexities of the medical and the financial underwriting, two, and then three, uh, because of, of, of the need to understand not only all of those things, but the complex and more sophisticated that investments that go into these, uh, there's just a handful of firms around the country, ours, ours being you know, one of them in this part of the country that specialize in this. So there, it's just not something that's really widely distributed or known about? We've had a lot of questions come in, a lot of interesting questions. So Matt, do you see any on the screen that uh, you, you'd like to answer or I can I can uh, go off the, or I can ask. Them. Yeah, no, I can, I, can, I can hit, yeah, I can hit as many of these as possible. Uh, so so okay. one of them is uh, do uh, the PPLI have their own list of funds? The answer is yes. Um, most of them are going to have, you're going to have two categories of funds. You're going to have what I call your kind of traditional IDF. So you're your Fidelities, your T. Rowe prices, your Vanguards of the world, your basically your mutual funds, and then you're going to have a list of uh, you know alternative uh, investments again, hedge funds, private equity, private lending, those types of things. Uh, so most of the carriers that are active in this space have a pretty robust list out there. Uh, most of them, there is a process if somebody would like to have access to a specific fund or there's a specific manager that would like their fund available on these platforms, uh, there, there is a process to go through. It takes a little bit of time and effort and money, but uh, we, we have had several funds added to platforms, either at the request of a money manager or at the request of a client. Obviously, you still are going to have your investor control limitations and issues uh, in there that you have in traditional life insurance. But um, so, so yes, they do. Um, there's another question. Can you transfer current investments into PPLI? Answer is no. Analogy I will draw here, very similar to funding a qualified retirement plan, cash dollars have to come in. And so uh, if you own a piece of real estate or a hedge fund or a private equity fund, you can't use that as a premium. You can only put cash dollars into these. And then once they're in the products, then you can allocate them to the, the various investments. Um, uh, let's see here. What happens to investments when the insured dies? Really good question. Um, and there, there's a lot of fine print in these, as, as uh, many of you may know, some of these invest investments have liquidity restrictions. So you may be in a hedge fund that has quarterly or annual liquidity. You may be in a private equity fund uh, that, that could take quite some time to pay out. And so um, generally the way that works is the, the net amount at risk, the death benefit over and above the cash value is, is, is paid out on, you know, pretty immediately within typically three to six weeks of death. Uh, to the extent that there are liquid investments in there, those are monetized and paid out as well. Um, if there are other investments in there in the alternative space that take more time to pay out, those are paid out. They're still income tax free, but they are paid out as liquidity becomes available. Something worth probably noting is most of the families that we have issued private placement life insurance products with also have traditional insurance that they have used more for death benefit planning. And so uh, while these do pay out at death, most of the time, uh, the family planning is not dependent upon those death benefit proceeds at the death of the insured. Um, looking through other questions. So I asked me uh, in my example, why we insured generation two versus generation one really had to do with longevity. 
uh, and cost. Uh, the the cost of insuring, I think that generation one in, in this case was in their late 60s, maybe close to 70. Uh, and generation two that we insured was age 39. So the cost in the policy was lower to insure generation two, number one. But quite frankly, more importantly is generation two had a 45 year life expectancy. Generation one had a 15 year life expectancy. We wanted to get the benefit of multiple decades of, of that tax deferred compounding. And so that's the reason we selected uh, generation two. Um, looking at what else here. Um, yeah, so there's a little thing about investor control. I mean, that, that gets into some, some complexity. I'll, I'll, I'll give you, you know, you cannot have investor control in a life insurance policy. So the, the policy owner, while you can do, uh, uh, allocate amongst the various funds and investments that may be on the menu, you can't say purchase uh, Microsoft or Apple stock. Uh, but you could purchase a fund that might have a heavy weighting towards those. So there are various rules on investor controls. We have had two examples where uh, a, a money manager wanted to get their fund on, in both these cases were hedge funds, they wanted to get their fund on a platform and then they wanted to also invest in that. And uh, this was not a determination we made, it was a ter determination legal counsel made. But ultimately, for both of them, it was decided that if they were going to be actively involved in making investment decisions within that fund, they could have their fund on the platform. Other people could do it, but they wouldn't be able to do it because that would uh, violate investor control. I will qualify. I am not an expert on investor control. Uh, that There are attorneys out there that specialize uh, in that area. Um, but but that is a, a, good, a good question. There's another one here. How does the insurance producer get paid? Great question. As you guys uh, may, may be aware, in a traditional life insurance structure, uh, the, the bulk of the compensation that's paid to the agent is front loaded. So it's, it's coming out in year one. That's one of the reasons why you tend to see very uh, nominal sur cash surrender values in year one. You may pay $100,000 in a policy and the surrender value may be zero to $30,000. That's because a, a pretty sizable commission uh, is paid out. What you're going to typically see in, in these is, is and, I, and I'm going to give a range because that varies based upon the advisor and the firm and the company you work with. We're typically looking at zero to 3%. Um, you're looking at 50 to sometimes 90% on a traditional insurance contract. And so um, I did not, I meant to cover this in the, in the presentation, but if, if, if we pay money into a private placement contract and we have even a five or six percent earnings rate in year one in most of the contracts we're going to at the end of the first year your cash surrender value is going to be greater than the premiums you put in most of these products uh, also have no surrender charges um so so really the only thing um if you needed to get money out or you needed to cancel it or just the charges that occur on an annual basis Yeah, somebody asked about, about a PPLI and, and, and avoiding or deferring a, a tax treatment on the sale of the business. Again, only cash can go on. So this is a wonderful uh, deferral and quite frankly, tax elimination strategy if you hold it until death. But there, there, there's really no way to uh, uh, get, the, get sales proceeds from, from a business or real estate or any other asset into private placement and, and not have a tax consequence in the, uh, in, in the middle. So this is not a... Um, a way to eliminate or mitigate taxes from the sale of an asset. It's just a way to eliminate or mitigate them on after-tax dollars that you're investing going forward. Um, there's a question on carriers. Um, you know, I'm always kind of a little, little hesitant to, to get in this because there are a lot of great carriers out there. I'm going to uh, um, you know, name the, the, the major ones that are out there in the market today. Uh, and I'll probably miss one or two. Um, uh, Lombard International, which used to be Philadelphia Financial, has been in the business probably about as long as anybody. Uh, Prudential, which is also major on the, on the traditional side, is in the business. Uh, Pacific Life um, is in the business. Um, Crown is a, is a, a pretty major player in the space. Uh, Brandon Jamie, if I'm, I know I'm probably missing one or two. Those are the ones that we're most familiar with and work with. Um, uh, so, again, as I alluded to earlier, there are really only about five or six carriers that, that do most of the business where there's, you know, in the low thousands of carriers that do traditional insurance business. Yeah, we're certainly familiar with all of those those names, um, Matt. We use we, we work with those those folks all the time. Um, one of the questions that, that seems to be coming in quite a bit that I failed to address at the very beginning of the presentation 
is that the, the handout or the slide deck, if you will, as well as a recording the presentation will be sent to all of the attendees today. So, so you'll have that. Um, Jamie, could you maybe speak to a moment as it relates to peak trust companies fees? Of course, um, I saw a number of questions come up related to that, so I, I appreciate the chance to address it. So, so yeah, if you are interested in peak trust company management or trustee services, uh, I'm more than happy to send our fee schedule out to you. Um, so if we're looking at Alaska trustee services, we have a setup fee of $2,000, and then we have a $2,500, $2,500 annual fee uh, for, again, the trust services where Peak is acting as trustee. Um, and it's a trust that only owns life insurance, private play placement life insurance. There are no other assets owned by this trust. Um, there are different fee structures should the client want to engage Peak as their trustee with a trust that owns um, additional assets plus the PPLI. Uh, there's just different services, different duties and responsibilities related to that. Um, so our fee will change slightly. Uh, if we switch gears and look at Alaska LLCs, uh, the total first year fee, I believe is roughly, I say roughly because this is dependent on what we call pass-through fees. They're state related fees, but uh, that first year is roughly 39, 3,900. Uh, so our peak fees are a $1,500 one-time setup fee, and then a $2,500 annual fee. And then as I mentioned, there are what we call pass-through fees. There's the article filing fee, registered agent fee, and then a corporate tax fee that we do collect on behalf of the LLC and pay on behalf of the LLC, but there are no additional peak-related fees to the filings on either the first initial or the biennial, the every other year. Uh, and then switching over to Delaware, our fees do change, um, you know, looking at, again, just simply trust in Delaware, uh, that there's not an option for LLC supported by Delaware statute. So um, to take advantage of private placement, life insurance through a trust, domiciled in Delaware, our fees would be, um, a 2000 one-time setup fee and then a $3,000 annual fee. And again, that is a trust simply just owning private placement life insurance. If there are additional assets, um, then further conversations and then our fee structure will change slightly again, changes their duties and responsibilities. But um, it, there are differences between, of course, each state and benefits to each state, so I'm happy to talk about that one-on-one -on -one because each client is so different and they're unique in their needs. So we're always happy to set up a separate call, um, talk through those fees, talk through what it is the client might need, um, and then go from there. Hey, Brandon, one question I've seen here a couple of times and I'll briefly address it. I don't know that I've got a, a wonderful answer, but there's been a couple of questions about Congress investigating private placement life insurance. And I believe the gentleman's, the, the Congressman's name is Ron Widens. I mean, first, qualify. I'm no uh, legislative or policy expert, and I don't know that I'll ever understand how things work or happen in Washington, D.C. Uh, I would say what I've, what I've heard, there was an article written about it pretty recently. It sounds like some saber rattling. I have no idea what amount of substance there is to that. Uh, I'll provide a couple of comments. Number one is that um, private placement life insurance is, is life insurance, uh, uh, while it's structured and designed a little bit different. It meets all of the statutory requirements of Section 7702 of the code. So I don't know how you would change and say that, that, that you can't use private placement life insurance anymore if you didn't go change 7702. Um, so, so that would be the first thing. Um, the second thing, and again, I'm not at all forecasting that, that this uh, that anything will ever come of this because Congress people congressmen talk about uh, potential legislation and tax legislation all the time and, and nothing ever comes to it. Uh, but, but, what, but what I can tell you is that historically when changes are done, whether it's tax structural or otherwise in the insurance industry, most of the time those are grandfathered. The most significant being, for those of you who have been, been practicing long enough to remember when the tax code changed in 1986, there were some very different life insurance structures. You could put a whole lot more money in an insurance contract back then 
uh, with a very low death benefit. And even though they changed that and said, hey, you can't, you're not going to be able to do this anymore, they grandfathered every policy that had been enforced at that point. And so I think it would be very difficult for Congress to try to single out quite frankly, something that just has a name that, that that it's called differently because private placement life insurance is just life insurance, just kind of like whole life insurance and variable life insurance. It's more of an acronym that we call it, but legally and structurally, it is life insurance no different than a whole life or universal contract issued by any major carrier. And so I think it would be very difficult for Congress to do anything and have some kind of retroactive impact on it. I cannot speak to the likelihood of anything ever coming of this or where this might go. But I, I, I did read the article that they're referring to. I've seen nothing of it since. So that's as best I can answer that. Good question. That's a great, great question and appreciate you addressing that, uh, Matt. And I think our experience has essentially been the same. You know, a question that we got that, <clears throat> that I think should be addressed that we didn't address earlier, and it's really probably more suited towards Jamie, the question is, is um, <clears throat> really, is an LLC in a favorable jurisdiction sufficient to change situs for premium tax purposes, or does the owner slash trust have to be situs there as well? I think the question to me is a little bit chunky, but I think that the, the response is, and Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have an existing trust in a state other than Alaska, Delaware, perhaps South Dakota or Wyoming, but you wanted to take advantage of the state premium tax, you could do that by having the existing trust that again is situs in some other state, create an Alaska LLC, and you could acquire the, the policy in the Alaska LLC um, to take advantage of that premium tax. Is that right, Jamie? Right, so you know that trust that is governed or situs in a separate state than Alaska or Delaware, yeah, you could uh, create an LLC, that trust would own the LLC, that LLC, peak being appointed as manager, um, would work with the carrier of choice and of course that agent that the family is working with to obtain that private placement life insurance policy. That seems, seems like a great opportunity. And you Brandon, know, I will say that there, there are several others just on here that I'm not uh, too many to get into that are that are fairly detailed about private placement. Y'all have my um, email address up there. Uh, you can also you know, get my contact information on our <laughs> website, but anybody that has a question that's related to, to private placement life insurance, not, not um, you know, the, the, the trust management side, I would direct those to Brandon and Jamie and their team. But feel free to shoot me an email or uh, look at the website, pick up the phone and call me. I'll be happy to, uh, to talk to anyone you know, in the future. Thanks for extending that invitation, Matt. Um, one question that, that I'd like to, to ask and answer um, <clears throat> Matt, is there, is there an opportunity for premium finance with private placement life insurance? <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty big question. Uh, the answer is certainly, um, and, and for those of you that are familiar with premium financing, you're, you're basically talking about, you know, using borrowed dollars from a financial institution to put the premiums in versus using your own dollars. You know, I will say for you know, a lot of the clients that we're working with, we already have substantial amounts of dollars that exist in, in, um, in these trusts that are, that are outside of their state. So that's probably the most common funding mechanism. Uh, I would say, Brandon, that was probably a question that I, I, I was getting asked a lot, you know, going back 10 months to several years ago, I think, you know, while you can still do that, the, you know, with, with interest rates rising 300 plus basis points and probably going up another 50 to 75, if you assume you can kind of earn the same on your investments today that you could a year ago, the arbitrage that you can create between the financing costs versus, you know, what the policy can earn have certainly been diminished. Uh, the other, the other area where a lot of times we'll see premium financing is, uh, the clients already exhausted all of their, you know, state uh, their their lifetime exemptions, their annual exclusions, and they want to fund uh, PPLI in a trust. You could certainly, you know, finance that with with families' existing dollars uh, and, and loan it to the trust, or you could borrow those from a financial institution. That's really more of a client and fact specific and an economic decision. So the answer is yes, absolutely. You can use premium financing, and it's it's in some ways easier to do than the, than the retail contracts because you, you've got, in most cases, 100% cash surrender value in year one, where that's usually not the case in a traditional life insurance contract, which gives you some collateral issues with the lender. 
Um, but but I, I will say it's been more common for us to do that with traditional policies as opposed to private placement. But there, there's no reason you couldn't do it. It's just not something that we've done a lot of in the private placement space. Perfect, Matt. Well, folks, um, you know, I want to thank I want to thank Matt and Jamie for their time, their practical examples and sharing their their extensive knowledge. I want to thank the audience for their participation and all of the questions. We've, we've got so many questions. There's no way we'd be able to get through them all today in the time that we have set aside for this. But I want to reassure you again that you will all receive the slide deck. You will also receive a recording of today's presentation. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can reach Matt, as he indicated. I think the, uh, the email address for Matt is mattj at legacycapitalwp.com, um, excuse me, or it can be reached at 501-376-7878. And of course, you can reach Jamie at J Rowley, that's R-O-W-L-E-Y, at peaktrust.com, or by calling her at 907-278. 6775. We very much appreciate your participation today and we look forward to additional questions. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you.